John Baldoni, welcome to the Plant Yourself podcast. Well, thank you, Howie. I am looking forward to having a good conversation with you. So, R right on. Let's let's do it. First, first of all, let's introduce you to my audience. Can you give us give us the the elevator or, or the escalator or the stairs? <laughs> I, I hadn't heard it quite right, as the escalator, uh, Howie, but I do <laughs> like that term. I, as you know, I, like you, I'm a member of uh, 100 Coaches, which was founded by Marshall Goldsmith. Um, three things I do uh, in interest of helping women and men become more effective leaders to live and learn how to lead with greater purpose and greater grace. I'm the author of 16 books and I um, speak regularly. Uh, and uh, so that's kind of my shtick. And my brand newest book is mm -hmm. the one over my shoulder, which is Grace Under Pressure, Leading Through Change and Crisis. So. All right. So 16 books. What what made you start writing books? Well, my original career was in marketing communications. So I was a writer. And by, even before that, Howie, I uh, I'm an English major. So I'm one of those people who's actually putting his English degree to good use. Uh -huh. And what I learned in English composition was how to um, get to the point quickly, you know, uh, expository writing, explain it, and then write your conclusion. So I migrated from advertising, marketing, communications. I became a speech writer uh, for senior leaders. And I always like to say this story of Howie, and you know it too. The way we frame leadership now is something as a fad. Of course, leadership has been with us since time immemorial, but in the corporate sector, it's really only been around since the you know four decades or so. All the leadership examples or practice of leadership and teaching of leadership was really confined to the military, unfortunately. But now it's you know you can get a PhD in leadership studies, which is all good. So I was interested in the topic of leadership, and you know when one of the hallmarks of or maybe the chief hallmark of being a speechwriter is anonymity. So I would write these presentations on leadership, and I would say, you know, I'd rather be saying though. So I'd rather be the one on stage. So I went back, got a graduate degree and uh, started pursuing it and began writing. So writing is, you know, my core skill, if you will, but I've migrated into executive coaching and teaching and uh, those types of things. So, hmm. so it sounds like you're, you're, you're a historian of sort of a, 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 a historian of the history of leadership. Right, yeah, which, I, which I find very interesting because when when we think about leadership, there, you know, very few people think historically. So I'm a history major, so that's oh. that's my bias. Is like everything came from somewhere, even though we think like whatever is here has kind of always been here. Can you kind of give us your understanding of like how how the idea of leadership has evolved, let's say, over the last hundred years? Well, sure, and I'll, I'll default to um, a, a man that uh, you know of well and was Marshall uh, Goldsmith's mentor, and that was um, Peter Drucker. And Peter Drucker was, you know, he's not the first management writer, but maybe one of the first to integrate the studies of leadership. And he is training, he's Austrian by birth, uh, emigrated to the U.S. and before the Second World War, um, and started studying leadership. He worked for General Motors, uh, right for Sloan, uh, excuse me, Alfred Sloan, who helped build General Motors to what it became, and did a, a, I think of the story of the corporation, something like that. And throughout that, in, his, in Peter Drucker's writings, he often made great references to uh, leadership from, you know, the time of ancient history through the through the Catholic Church and, uh, you know, histor history throughout Europe and things like that, the importance of leadership. So he was kind of my guidepost in that. And I, like yourself, I am a student of leadership. And so many of the great examples of, uh, of leadership and study come from history um, and often military history, too. What goes right and what sometimes goes wrong, too. So we learn that kind. So that's my sense. And I think somewhere, I don't know why, uh, how, uh, uh, maybe due to Tom Peters, too, uh, his book In Search of Excellence, you know, a, a theme through that is the why do teams, excuse me, why do organizations succeed? Well, they've got good leaders, you know. And so that came out in, 
you know, his book he wrote with um, his colleague, uh, Robert Waterman, um, came out in the early 80s. And that, you know, that became something of a must read book for all of us in pursuing leadership. So that's my dime store analysis. And mm. <laughs> just, uh, all right, but thank you. So, so w- one of the things that comes to me is that there's a problem if our model of leadership is military. Mm. And that's the only model. <laughs> you agree, you're you nodding agreement. What, what's, what, what's your take on that? I will give you a great example. Thank you. That's, that's a great um, example. And I once heard um, Pete, um, blanking out on his name, but I, at Wharton, um, uh, gave a presentation about leadership. And here was the, uh, blanking out his name, so shame on me, but he was the last Heisman Trophy winner at Army, went on and became a distinguished uh, military officer, uh, served in Vietnam, and then later in public service and corporate leader and all that kind of stuff. And he said, you know, one of the things we, um, our, our model of leadership is the 19th century British cavalry officer who rode <laughs> a white horse. Well, that excludes about 95%, well, I <laughs> said, 99.7% of, uh, of the population. I think, I used to say flippantly that people would say, well, what has changed in leadership? And I would say nothing, because we're doing the same thing. There's actually been two major changes in my perspective. One is globalism, and we're much more connected inter, you know, inter, uh, worldwide. What happens in one section of the world can affect another immediately. Classic example, of course, is COVID. Uh, and, you know, started in a, uh, an obscure town in, in, in China and then, you know, paralyzed the world. The other thing, and the better thing, is the integration of women into management and senior leadership positions, Not as well as we have a much more diverse uh, uh, section of people from all different ethnicities and backgrounds who are in leadership positions. So yes, the 19th century British cavalry uh, model is an old one and needs to be retired uh, and has been. Uh, so I would take that. And the interesting thing about leadership, and, and again, going back to Wharton, as a gentleman, I learned a lot f- about leadership was Michael Usain. And Michael was maybe a longtime professor at Wharton. He was one of the first to integrate studies of leadership from outside corporate. So he integrated military models, arts, uh, nonprofits, all of those things. Why? To get a better perspective on what leadership is at all levels. And so your question is a very good one. So, and then as you well know, leadership is not a title. Um, It's an earned authority and it happens uh, at every level. So. Uh, so like when I think about, you know, classical leadership, the, the leader had to have a good plan, right? Or, you know, a, a bold vision and then just had to like be either respected or feared. And you just told people what to do and, and presumably they would do it. Um, when did the idea of you have to motivate people enter enter the world? Well, I, well I, the, the quick answer would be late 20th century um, with, I'll say, uh, us baby boomers <laughs> getting into it because we're not going to take it anymore. We were rebelling against authority. I think a more uh, informed answer is actually, <clears throat> in deference, um, looking at the American military. Um, one of the reasons that it has been successful is, and which is not widely known outside military circles, is there's a lot of feedback from the ground up. While the commander does have his intentions, um, it must be constant uh, interplay between all ranks to to make sure things happen, uh, and so that they're pushing decision rank it's decision making down to the ranks, and that's what we need to distributed leadership, if you will, for lack of a better term. Um, and because organizations now are far more complex than they were before in many ways, so you need information and you need people to make decisions at appropriate levels. So. Every Everything doesn't end up, <clears throat> excuse me, everything doesn't end up on the lap of the person in charge. And, and also, um, I think that, again, uh, women in senior leadership positions have really changed the equilibrium, too, because, you know, we men um, uh, are uh, kind of hard headed at times and women are much more uh, open minded and willing to accept different ideas. And the 
great example of this, uh, and I gained this from uh, my show that you have been on, uh, Grace Under Pressure. I interviewed Julia Burstein, who's a reporter and an author, and she did a book called When Women Lead. And in her research, she said that women executives during the period of lockdown recently were perceived as doing better um, result-wise than male counterparts. Why? Because women leaders were not afraid to ask for help. And you know how we, some of us men don't even want to ask for directions, <laughs> but women mm -hmm. will say, hey, what can we do? And so women are op more open-minded uh, to these kinds of things. So again, that has changed this perspective of, the, of, of what leaders are and what leaders can do and should do. So. Hmm. Have, have you seen a shift for the better in terms of acceptance of women's leadership styles? Because we hear all about all so often about damned if you do, damned if you don't. If you're if you're tough, you're a bitch. If you're, you know, if you're kind, you're wishy washy. Um, has has there has there been a greater acceptance and maybe since the pandemic of the, the 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 power of a more feminine style of leadership? I, I cannot speak statistics wise from, I mean, from research, because it's not a top, it's outside my realm. Right. But I will say short answer is yes. And the other answer is no. Um, I think it's much <laughs> more difficult for women to succeed. They have to be better in leadership. Women have to be better at men at doing whatever it is. The same thing for um, uh, minorities, uh, blacks and Asians must be better than white counterparts. Um, and that's a sad thing. And then they prove themselves and they do very well. Uh, and then there's always, you know, well, stereotypes of, uh, well, she got there because of this or affirmative action on these kind of things. These, these folks did not earn their roles. And that is a denigration. I, I think that's going to pass with time um, sooner than later, I hope, but it's, it's residuals are still there. And frankly, there are not enough women uh, and senior leadership positions. Um, but the data does show that when women, uh, certainly for corporate boards, when there are women, uh, or at least half of the board is comprised of women, the organizations often outperform other organ comparable organizations. And they do that financially as well as uh, in other areas too. So I think things mm -hmm. are changing, but um, it, it's, it's still an uphill slog. It's still an uphill slog. Mm. So. Well, that reminds me of one, one of the later chapters of your book, Grace Under Pressure. You're talking about sort of community and engagement, and you're, you're listing things that I think could very well be corporate metrics of success in terms of like the mental health and the physical health of employees, which, no, I mean, you know, I know our, our, our friend Michael Gelb talks about that in the healing organization. But like that's not mainstream stuff. Like what's, no, but I think where, where, it, the, yeah. a, a light has been shined on that issue, fortunately, due to COVID. Um, and you know now the the um, uh, as you know in the states there is an epidemic of loneliness, and it is a health problem. And so I have this philosophy or uh, hope, and, and I think it's possible to turn your workplace into a community. And that really builds on the ideas that uh, Amy Edmondson has pioneered with psychological safety. And this is where grace enters the picture. Everybody wants to be part of something greater than themselves. We, we want to belong. We want to have community. And that doesn't mean we think nor act alike, nor should we, but it means we, we, there is a place for us and we can voice uh, our, our ideas and will be heard. That doesn't mean our ideas will be acted upon, but we, it is safe for us to uh, voice them. So in that sense, we're getting, there's greater awareness of um, the, the, you know, the, the human being as a whole person, um, you know, psychological, you know, uh, implications as well. So, cause mental health is a serious issue, uh, and, and mental health is health. Um, and there's greater awareness of it. The sad part is we don't have enough resources. So can corporate step up and address this issue? 
I, I think they are um, and can, but we can all do better. I'm not going to say it's all on business. All of us mm -hmm. have to pull that. All of us have to de work to destigmatize um, mental health issues. Um, and so you're right. It's it, it's an issue that um, is is affecting our culture, but it's also in, in some ways it's making us more human because we understand one another's vulnerabilities. So. Mm -hmm. Well, and that, and that has led to, I think, um, more openness about, you know, you, it's, it's okay to tell people that you're struggling, that like, I'm, you know, I'm not okay right now. I think you're, you know, you're right about this as well, that you can, you know, that how, how are you, you can, you can speak. And like, I think that there has always been like, okay, I'm walking into the office, I'm leaving my humanity. I don't know if you've seen the, the Apple Plus show uh, Severance. Mm -hmm. Right. I, well, it was I'm literally people. I haven't seen it, but yes. I'm, I'm, yeah. So. Right. Well, the, you know, the, the, the conceit is that that they do an operation on your brain and you literally can't remember who you are in your <laughs> private life. Yeah. When you walk into the office, they turn off one switch and turn off and turn on the other. And that was, you know, it's kind of a metaphor for like, um, you know, I don't I leave my humanity at the door. And are, are right. you seeing in your in your work with organizations and with leaders that that's shifting? I th I think that uh, you know and uh, yes, um, and, and the sense that because of because of the hybrid workplace, and because we you know we were locked down for a while and we were all communicating on Zoom, people saw their colleagues in their home environment. So that gave us a window on who they really are or part of who they were. And so, and when now we're in a hybrid or maybe back, you know, five days a week for certain sectors, um, then yes, I think we have a greater understanding of that. There's not total acceptance. And what you said something about that from severance of checking my personality, my being at the door, that often happens with uh, people of color. Uh, our black colleagues talk about the 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 the, ta the, the challenges of um, being being a, a, a black in a management and, and chiefly white uh, environments, um, and how they have to kind of adopt another uh, personality, if you will. And when they leave work, it, it's a sense of decompression. It's an extra added level mm -hmm. of stress. And I want to say that's going to change, but it would probably take more time. But I think talking about it, shining a light on it will make it more visible. And I also believe that, um, uh, our children, uh, my children, our millennials, and then Gen Z are much more aware of these kinds of things. They've grown up in a more multicultural, multiracial environment. And so they're more cognizant of this. And they have seen uh, women in leadership positions, uh, minorities in leadership positions. So they have different role models and see possibilities. You know, the, the statement of, I see myself in her, I see myself in him. I think that's a great way of facilitating acceptability and learning. And so uh, I'm an optimist uh, on that kind of thing, but we have challenges that we cannot ignore. So, mm. so the, uh, the Hollywood story of the leader is, you know, someone comes in to a culture that is bad in some way and through the force of their personality, they change it. So the most recent example that's very popular is Ted Lasso, who <laughs> changes the the culture of this you know British football team. There's you know going back to Robert Redford and Brubaker as coming in and reforming the prison system, right? So like, how realistic is that in terms of actual leaders changing culture through the, their force of personality, or like what what do you see as the path to being a, a transformative, transformative leader. It's a, it's a good point. And I'm a, as you know, I'm a huge Ted Lasso fan. I've written three posts on it for Forbes.com where I contribute. So yeah, I love that series. Um, and, and I will give you two examples of leaders who I've known who have done this. One is our, both of them are members of 100 Coaches. The first is Gary Ridge, who for more than two decades was the CEO of 
WD-40. Gary was the one that pioneered the concept of managers as coaches. Um, and that's that personal investment of a coach in, the, excuse me, a personal investment of a coach in a, enabling the success of others. Um, and Gary was able to do that you know, by his example. The other example is, of course, Alan Mulally. And Alan came in at Ford Motor Company when it was in pretty dire straits. He was probably about a few months away from bankruptcy. Alan's great feat was to get people to work together. And Ford, I had for years did uh, work at Ford. And so I, under, I understand their culture. It was basically a series of fiefdoms and siloed things. And so there wasn't a lot of collaboration or cooperation. Um, Alan kind of got his senior team together through um, meeting weekly uh, at 7 a.m. on Thursday morning. Uh, all the chiefs of different depart different functions, be it purchasing, manufacturing, uh, product design, whatever, in the same room together. And so each one heard the situation and other functions. And Alan was always saying, okay, Howie has a problem here. Who's going to help How <clears throat> Howie? And over time, it became a co cooperative effort. Oh, I can help him with that. I can help her with this. So, and then Alan's mantra is love and service, you know, love your people and serve them. And it's, it can be, uh, it can sound Pollyanna, Ish, but when Alan did it, and the same thing with Gary, by investing themselves and believing in this and reinforcing their belief in others, but also the sense of toughness too. They're both highly resilient individuals um, and um, through um, their ideas, but also drawing upon the strengths of others, the team um, was able to affect positive change. So no, the Hollywood model doesn't quite work that way, um, but it's because it overlooks people who jump in and do it. But um, but I think, and that's the key to any transformation is you have to have the buy-in of others around you. So, mm. so you see, you, this is your 16th book, Grace Under Pressure. Oh. I'm not very what? smart. I keep doing the same thing. <laughs> yeah. Well, if it keeps working, then you are very smart. Yeah, <laughs> I enjoy it. Yeah. What, what, when, when did the concept of grace sort of emerge in, in your work? Thank you for asking that, Howard, because I had written about grace a couple of times previous to it. But really, um, and no surprise, I was in the late teens, maybe 2016, 2017, uh, 2018, you know, the public discourse and the the U.S. was pretty awful, and it's not much better now, maybe even worse than it was. And so I said, well, I could write a screed about that, but who cares? And I'm just contributing to the division. So I looked hmm. around and I saw people uh, in our community, but also nationally different places, people acting with goodness and intended kindness. So I wrote my book, Grace, A Leader's Guide to a Better Us. And one of the people I did interview for that book was Alan Mulally. And, and so I turned grace into an acronym, generosity, respect, compassion, action, and energy. The book came out in May of 2019. Did I've got great reviews, lots of attention, but really didn't sell. And then we got six months later, we were hit with COVID and people started thinking about, oh, um, empathy. You know, um, we need to connect more effectively. So that led me to write another little book, which is uh, called Grace Notes, which is more uh, my attempt at poetry, short reflections on what leaders were experiencing at that time and what they should be doing to mobilize their people. And I had great fun writing that one. And then, but I thought further and further about grace and um I, uh, someone, it was our colleague C.B. Bowman mentioned the word grace under pressure. I said, I wanted to give grace some muscle. She goes, how about grace under pressure? And I thought about it and I go, yeah, that's it. You know, um, cause great leaders act with, uh, keep it together when times are tough. And we're seeing a living example of this is something like uh, Vladimir uh, Zelensky and uh, Ukraine, you know, keeping his country together uh, and unified against uh, 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 existential threat. 
Um, so that's the kind, but uh, people look to their leaders when in times of stress. And so in times of stress, leaders do three things, take care of their team, take care of themselves and prepare for the future. I think there's another dimension to that, which is do it with courage, uh, conviction and compassion. And that leads, I think, to uh, a final C word, and that is co connection. It leads to community. So that's what we're looking. So if we create community in our own lives, we have others uh, uh, to rely upon, but also others we can love and serve. So, mm -hmm. so uh, what before grace was the, was an acronym. You know, it's it's a it's it's a word from religious canonical traditions. Um, what what parts of that uh, of that the origin of the word as almost something gifted that you don't you know that sort of lands right. upon you without being earned? How much of that is is in the word for you? I think all of it. Um, and, uh, you know, uh, it's, I, I was thinking of our colleague, Sally Helgeson, because I interviewed her to, for the book of uh, um, my first book on grace. And she was saying grace is given to us with no strings attached, which is, you know, comes out of a faith based tradition. And you're right. It, we do understand it. But every faith seems to have this concept of grace. But beyond that, it, it goes into uh, ancient times. The Greeks had a, a word for it. But also, I think it, it's we're wired in our DNA, Howie and you know this far better than I would, but it's this a sense of taking care of one another, at least familial or tribal. And so that's where grace is. And, um, uh, and I think that grace is the sense of giving. You know, I've done some work in purpose on the topic of purpose. And purpose is, Simon Sinek said and others say, purpose is our why. And so what does our why lead us to? Our vision, which is our sense of becoming, our mission, which is our doing, what we do, what we build. And then, but more than that, how, how do we stay together? We stay together through our values. And what nurtures our values is the sense of belonging and then connectivity and grace facilitates that. Grace is that ability to reach out and make a meaningful connection with an individual. It can be transactional, it can be transformative. And um, and I, as you know, because you've been a guest on my show, I ask every person to tell me a story about grace. And I've had, you know, people tell me a transactional thing um, that, you know, it was a bad rainstorm and someone handed me a, rain, uh, a rainbow, they handed me an umbrella um, and they remember that. But others, you know, shared deep stories about um, something that <clears throat> saved their life. But one example I think it is, is resonant. Um, one woman told me that her mother was taken very ill um, and her boss just pulled her aside and said, look, I want you to go. And here's something else I want you to do. I don't want you to think about work. I want you to focus on your mother and your family and yourself. And so she said that was a liberating thought. She could focus her energy at that time. And, you know, so for, for professionals, you know, you know, sadly, we often too often define ourselves uh, by our work. And so letting it go is hard. But when your boss says go and do it and focus, that's a, a thing. It was an act of grace. And there are many things. So grace, grace abounds. It's all around us. We simply have to tap into it. And I see it in communities. You know, I, I, I have the privilege of playing piano in an area hospital, in a local hospital. And um, when you're in, I, in the lobby there and I see people all the time and that reinforces my concept of grace, how people interact with one another. I see the way staff treats um, patients, of course, but how they uh, interact with family members and things like that. And so grace abounds. It's simply we have to be aware of it. And when we can give back, let's do it. So. Hmm. So one one thing that occurs to me is when you you know you were talking about 2016 to 2018 and things being worse now that sort of the public discord discourse is discord. It's very much about who you know who's the enemy, who do I not respect, and like I'm I'm not really a fan of say capitalist America in general, <laughs> but there's. <clears throat> Um, you know, my father was a, a left wing labor leader and I've inherited a lot of his yeah. 
his views. But some, so, something that occurs to me is that like organizations can't succeed by being divisive. That it's that, and and that there there might be a sort of you know a corporate antidote. And I think we've seen this a little bit with say companies that have tried to show their support for marginalized communities, whether mm -hmm. LGBT, mm -hmm. um, you know, sort of the Bud Light or or Target, um, or even Nike in certain cases, um, saying we must that in order to succeed we must inc we must put our energy into inclusion rather than exclusion. Yeah, I mean, and this is where corporations have the, in, uh, and uh, I'd say nonprofits as well, have the, uh, are leading the way because uh, certainly our national government is paralyzed. And what you're talking to is, uh, is grievance. Uh, when you are more interested in what you're against than what you are for, um, that's when problems occur. And so by showing support for others, it means something. And going back to the fictional example of Ted Lasso, why Ted Lasso, I, I write about this for the second season, what Ted had created and, and, and embraced by others, so it's not just Ted, but it was his example, was community. So there was a community on the team, the players had each other's backs, all successful sports teams are like that. There was a community with, ma with management, the support of management, and also the support of fans. And in the third post I did for them, I said, you know what? Because I heard when, when Ted Lasso went off the air, um, a, a woman was, was, my, was talking to my wife. She goes, oh, I'm going to so miss that story. What else Ted Lasso had created was community with fans. Mm -hmm. And I think that's what you're talking about when um, uh, com corporations take the lead in uh, recognizing marginalized communities. And they, and, you know, people come to them and it's, it's a place where they feel safe. And I like supporting this organization or not um, and they believe in it. we look at, look at people as people um, and there you know more we can do uh, together than we can as uh, the great Abraham Lincoln said a house divided cannot stand he of course was talking about slavery versus uh, slave state versus uh, non-slave state um, and it's the same for a business as a country cannot stand uh, if it's a house is divided you have we have to come together it doesn't mean we always agree on everything nor should we um, but um, I think that I want to believe always that there's more that can unite us than divides us. So, mm -hmm. yeah. Um, so, you know, we talked about grace. Now, you know, grace is easy when you're on top and everything's going well. So the challenge is obviously right. Like, like I'm a very pleasant person when I'm calm and relaxed. But when, you know, when this shit hits the fan, I can lose it. And I've done, and there's plenty of people who are listening to this now who can think of many examples of me over the course of my life behaving in ways that are completely embarrassing and were hurtful to others and damaged relationships and damaged my reputation. So what's the, you know, and, and again, you know, you write about like, you know, integrity and compassion and these things that are very e you know, easy words to spell if you if you're an English major, but <laughs> hard, like what 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 do you see as working like as a coach? How do you yeah. see people building the muscles of grace? <laughs> It's a great, great question. And thank you for your candor. And I know I have been uh, in times of my life too often, I have been a class A jerk. And so shame on me for that. So what does work? And this is the element of the book, which is probably the weakest part for most leaders. And that's the care for others. They can prepare for the future. Whom do they overlook? themselves. Self-care is important. Um, I quote our colleague uh, Sharon Melnick extensively because she's done a, a lot of, she's a clinical psychologist as well as an executive coach. And she, her topic of expertise is resilience. And so we need to learn to self-regulate. Okay. Um, and, you know, when we're working all the time, we burn out. And so um, there are practical things. So, okay, it's easy to say, slow down, stop working and all that, but how? Well, there's simple things, and you would know this probably far better than I do from your background, is the pause. Uh, my colleague of mine, Donald Altman, has written a lot extensively on mindfulness and practices. It just 
walking away from a situation, deep breathing, yoga helps, the concept meditation. Over time, and it's not when you're in the moment you don't meditate, but deep breathing, breathing from the diaphragm, developing it as a practice. But you know um, uh, the, the great thing, so there are some hows, um, uh, uh, Howie, but of course we need to uh, put them into practice and there has to be that intention. In our coaching, we cannot help those who do not want to help themselves. So we have to sh create a path for them and enable them to want to choose that path if possible. And so that's that commitment, wanting to make positive change. The way you do it, and you know, the thing is, is okay, here's what you're doing. You're harming yourself. They can ignore that, but you're not effective. You're not effective in your role. And so if you want to be more effective, you need to take examples of self-care, but you also need to reach out to others. You need to act with grace. Otherwise, your retention levels will continue to escalate. Your productivity will go down. Your mo team morale will uh, suck and people are going to leave and your business is, in, you know, you're going to get fired. <laughs> so the, those mm. kinds of things, that, that's kind of that hard reality that we face. But I think it's a willingness to make that commitment. And as you well know, and I know it myself, change is great for you, Holly, but I don't want to change. I'm fine, <laughs> you know, but recognition that I need to change. And I think here's a concept and get it where grace is. Gr we need to show ourselves some grace. Um, you, you just did, uh, were very candid with me about past, you know, so past bad behaviors, if you will. Um, recognize, hey, I'm a human being. Show myself some grace. Be grateful for who you are and what you can accomplish. So all the things about caring and compassion, focus them inward, because I think you really can't be mm -hmm. as effective if you uh, and compassionate to others if you're not compassionate to yourself. So, mm -hmm. so do, you, do you find that, you know, so if, if, if I'm going to change as a leader because I'm going to get fired if I don't, or, you know, I'm going to preside over the uh, stock price tanking, um, that's a, that's a very sort of quid pro quo. Like I'm only going to change enough and I'm probably going to change grudgingly and I'm only going to do the bare minimum to not have that thing happen. But when people move in that direction, especially with a coach like you, does something eventually shift where even if they go at it for the wrong reasons or for self-interested reasons, that something emerges that's more beautiful? I have, yeah, I have seen that. And, and you're right. If, if there is only extrinsic motivation to change, there will be change, but it won't be sustainable. And you know this when you, we see, uh, just like we think, I have a practice of putting in my best self, but when things really uh, start uh, hitting the fan, I revert to past behaviors. That happens all the time. And if you're extrinsically motivated for incentives or not being fired, you're going to revert more recently. What ultimately we hope happens, and I have seen this happen, is that people adopt new behaviors and they say, hey, this is working for me, you know, and mm -hmm. I like myself. This is important. I like myself better the way I am, the new John the new Howie. And that doesn't mean that we are that going to be that permanently and we'll never have a misstep. Of course not. I have this little mantra uh, or not mantra, but phrase I like to share called focus on better. So what does better mean? Well, a, a better spouse, a better colleague, a better friend, you define what better means and act upon it. And I also think there's a sense of forgiveness in this focus on better, because let's say you and I are colleagues, um, Howie, and I'm going to be more open to your ideas and because I can be short and I can be in a hurry. And so, you know, I'm going to listen to Howie more effectively, but sometimes you're going to catch me and I'm going to say, shut up, Howie. I, I walk out the room. Okay, darn it. You know, I really treated Howie poorly. 
I'm going to do it better I, the next time. So I say, Howie, hey, I lost it. I'm sorry. And I'm going to work on it. And am I going to change permanently forever? No, I'm going to slip up. You know, maybe I won't say it out loud, but I'll think it up in my mind. But over time, I, ideally, the better, the better, better uh, angels of our nature will take over. But, you know, we're still human beings. And we're still, at least I know I'll continue to screw up. <laughs> So I don't know if that's mm. a, a long winded answer there. So, yeah, well, I think what, one of the things you're saying is like the, <clears throat> the default back to the old way happens under pressure. Yes, 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 absolutely. Absolutely. And that's why that's the concept behind grace under pressure. Don't lose it. And you can practice, and this is where the concept of resilience comes in. And I've had the opportunity of interviewing people from special forces from different nations as well. And one of the things they do is they do, you know, uh, stress training. It could be live fire exercises, whatever it is. So when they get in a situation of extremists, they have been there before. Okay, they know how to act. Um, they may feel fear, and they probably should feel fear, but they know how to keep it together. The same for us in a, a non-combat situation is I have been through this exercise before. I have experienced pressure. I know what my triggers are. I know how, I, but I know I can make it through. So I keep it together, at least I sh outwardly, because my responsibility is to my team. And I think that maybe this is something the enabler, Howie, is stop focusing on myself and focus on what my team needs. And that's what I was dealing with the first part of Grace Under Pressure, taking care of your team. And when you're outwardly directed, in a way, I mean, you're, you know this more greater than I from your background in psychology, is it takes the pressure off yourself. You're focused on others. At the same time, at some point, you have to take care of yourself too. So that's it. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and I think I think a lot of it, the, the mediating factor is a kind of presence, not necessarily like, you know, the mindfulness that you'll read about in psychology today, but, um, you know, the, a, a, a practice of dually being yourself and, you know, not losing yourself to the team, mm -hmm. uh, but also not losing the team to yourself. Peter Bregman talks about this a lot around. Yes. Uh, you know, a, a, a kind of, um, you know, I would I would call it a kind of grace of comfortability in your own skin. Like, oh, th this is a very like to be able to say this is a very uncomfortable situation. And here I am. I am I'm tolerating it. I'm accepting it. And and I'm being here for it. I'm not going to. Right. Because when I when I lose it, I'm never present when I lose it. Right. <laughs> I always yeah. come back later and say, well, I had never you know, thought of that, Howie, who, but you're absolutely right. You're absolutely correct. Yes. Yeah. Like, yes. you know, who, who wielded the ax here? Right. <laughs> but to be able to, to be able to to be OK, saying, oh, this is this is unpleasant. This is horrible. Um, and here I am. It's a kind of right. it's a kind of acceptance of reality that allows that, I think. Yeah, and, and I think that getting back to uh, what we talked about earlier, the sense of community, it's not, I as the leader, I'm responsible, okay? But I, it's not a solo act, you know? Um, I'm in charge, but Howie, I need you. I need Sally. I need Sharon. I need Alan. I need all of us pulling together. And it's not just I need them to do things, but I might want to say, Howie, you know, this, I'm not really good at this. Is, um, uh, can I call on you to, to really help me through this uh, thing? And asking for help when I need it. That's, again, showing a sense of vulnerability. Um, you know, this is not my finest moment. Moment, Howie. So I'm going to really need, I'm going to rely on you to help me. That, mm. that, then when you do that, maybe even just saying those words takes the pressure off, you know, but it also builds the, a bond between you and me and your, uh, our brothers and sisters in this organization. And we're able to succeed um, uh, better because we're working together. We become a community, we belong, and we have one another's back. 
Um, I came up, I did a wonderful interview, or not, I didn't, but I, I, I did the interview with Sally Jenkins, who's a great reporter for the Wall Street Journal and best-selling author. She did a biography of Pat Summit, the great basketball, uh, women's basketball coach at the University of Tennessee. And, and uh, she was close to Pat and Pat told her, she said, you know, when the team is really doing well, you can hear it. And Sally said, what do you mean hear it? She goes, well, they have one another's back and that's what it is. So maybe that's the chatter amongst them or whatever. I think that's what an uh, integral part of community. We have one another's back and we can act together. Mm -hmm. And so it's not all on the leader. It's the leader and the team together. So, yeah. hmm. so what, what that's bringing up for me, you used, you used the word um, vulnerability. So I, before I got on the uh, Riverside with you, I was interviewing uh, a woman who had just written a book about underground ayahuasca guides. So, you know, psychedelic guides. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, they're all like women in their 70s, 80s, 90s so, even. And we we're yeah. talking about like the, the psychedelic movement now. And she says what these women all have that allowed them to practice safely was humility. Um, uh, and what a humility is, 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 all right, it's, it's a word that you can imagine, you know, an 84 year old woman who's been doing ayahuasca and MDMA and psilocybin for 50 years, but it's harder to imagine humility in someone who's risen to corporate leadership, right? It, feel, it feels Absolutely. like that's a, that's a, <laughs> I, no, abs absolutely. You're, you're, you're right. And I used to uh, sometimes drop this note in my keynotes. I would say humility is the one thing they don't teach you in B school, business school. <laughs> and so I think that's yeah. changed a little bit it's in part because of COVID and what we're all humbled by the situation. Um, but the sense of humility, it's when a leader says, I need help or can you, can we work together on this kind of stuff? That is a sign of strength. And it's also a sign of self courage, but it's also an invitation. Uh, you know, if I'm, you know, if you're my boss, Howie, and you say, um, I need help in this, or I'm struggling with this, I need your ideas, whatever, and you make yourself accessible to me and I want to help you. Now, can you overdose on humility, like in the sense of too much self-deprecation? I mean, I love self-deprecating humor, but I mean, if you say, well, you know, I'm really not up to this and I don't think I can do it. Well, I don't want to follow you, <laughs> but if you say, hey, mm. uh, and I, I know you're a strong leader in this regard or whatever, but um, when you say I need your help, um, I'm going to be drawn to you because I want to help you because I view you as, guess what? A human being, not merely my boss. So, mm -hmm. yeah. And, and, you know, like the classic story that I've learned about that one is Alan Mulally's first meeting with the Ford executives, right? Where, you know, what, like there's, there's um, the process that I use most to try to bring about transformation. My clients is called memory reconsolidation, which is essentially you get people into sort of the heightened state of some prediction, and then you provide several disconfirmation experiences. And like, that's a textbook case of they're all in there protecting themselves, terrified that the new guy is going to see through them and tells them, you know, if you have a problem, you bring it here. Nobody does for weeks until one person brings it the room, all the air is sucked out of the room. They're waiting for the ax to fall. And then Al Mulally says, great, thank you. Let's work on it. And at that moment, you could see like everyone's brain begin to rewire like the doors uh, in a Harry Potter movie, right? Like, yeah. like every, everything I thought about reality is a little bit different now. Yeah. That's great. And Alan tells an, uh, the, uh, a further anecdote about that he shared at our last meeting was that was that moment of change. And the person was Mark Fields, who eventually became Alan's successor. But he said, um, I said to Mark, he said, I want you to sit next to me at the meeting and at the next meeting, the next B BPR meeting. And uh, so then people saw him. I'm sitting next to Alan and they thought, oh boy, this is where they said, is the floor going to open up and swallow Mark whole, you know, but it was Mark did it or 
Alan did it as the recognition that, hey, you're part of the team and I need you. And it was a great example. So, yeah, it, it, it's but it changed. And you know, you're absolutely right. And that again, see, that is um, um, uh, that sense of where reliance on the team helps us all succeed. So. Mm -hmm. Gotcha. So what you said, you wrote another book um, about grace that, that didn't make huge waves. What are you hearing from people about grace under pressure? Because one, you know, one of the joys of being an author is after you've been, you know, shut up and, you know, outside of mainstream life for a while, then, you know, you write to apologize to the people you live with for having to put up with you writing a book, but then it goes out into the world and turns into a conversation. What, what have you been hearing? I think it's a great question. And we're still in the process of getting the message out because the book hasn't been out that long. But what I do hear is that I've made grace tangible and accessible in an organizational framework. What the book provides is the how, just the things that we've been talking about. You can speak in platitudes, of course, you know, like you can drop the word compassion or courage and all those things. What I do is I show examples of it. And then, you know, um, I, I dimensionalize it, if you will, I show the practical aspect of it. There's even a self-assessment on these kinds of things. So it, it's made grace in a organizational framework accessible. And I think that's what I hear. Mm. So mm. does anybody come to you and say, I want to learn grace or does, <laughs> does that, is that kind of a right? Like we would, I would like to live in that world, but it's, it's hard for me to believe that that's how people arrive at. No, at I, I have, I, I did have an example of that when I did the first book, I was being interviewed and, and the person hadn't read the book and that I don't take offense at that because, you know, you can't read everything that comes your way and, and all of those types of things. But he said, can you give me an example, John, where you went into an organization and you gave them grace and they changed? And I said, it's a little above my pay grade. <laughs> so he was looking mm. at grace kind of like the next agile or the next blue ocean strategy. So you can't, you can show grace. I can, you know, give grace if, if I'm in a leadership position, my role as the outsider, as the coach is to illustrate what it is and provide practical paths to attain, to attain in it, if you will. So I have to take that step back. In my own life, I need to do a better job of showing grace under pressure by keeping it together, not losing my cool at stupid things or really ever, you know, um, being more mindful of others, being more present, being active, acting with compassion, looking to connect with people who need it, uh, being a friend to others. And, you know, our colleagues, uh, Adrian uh, Gostick and uh, Chester Elton have written about gratitude. And, you know, that's a form of grace, that connectedness. And one of the, in, one of the inspirations for me in, in the topic of grace <clears throat> is uh, Father Greg Boyle, who runs the largest, mm. who founded Homeboy Industries in uh, East LA. It's the the largest gang intervention program. And why do kids join gangs? Well, they, they don't have a life at home because there, it may not even be a home life. So they gravitate to gangs. What is gang? It's a form of community. So when they leave that, they, they're searching, searching for something else. Homeboy Industries provides a kind of community. And uh, Father G, as he's called, often talks about uh, connectedness, kinship, radical kinship is the term he uses, making that connection with others. And sometimes uh, how it's just a matter of occupying space with some someone. And you know far more than I do, but let's say you and I are, uh, you're my friend and I sit down next to you someday and I say, Howie, I know you're struggling with this. Here's the three things you need to do. Boom, 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 boom. You might look at me like, I'm kind of presumptuous. I might be a jerk, mm. but probably whatever I say isn't going to matter. But how about you and I just share a park bench together, a metaphorical park bench, and we just sit. Maybe we talk, maybe we don't. I'm there. I'm physically present there. Okay. And then if you want to talk, we have a conversation and you maybe mention something you're struggling with. And I said, you know, I have experience with this. Would you like my 
two cents on this and we have a conversation. I'm making that connection and that all of us can make that connection. Um, patience is a form of grace. We all can learn to be more patient with others. And I know that's a weakness of mine. <laughs> patience is a virtue, um, but um, being more patient. All of these things are, in my opinion, acts of grace. So. Mm -hmm. Well, if you want to learn patience, I recommend moving to Spain. <laughs> As you are doing now. Yeah. 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 It's, a, it's, it's an enforced lesson. Yeah. Um, yeah. I mean, you know, and the other, the other thing that comes to me is that, you know, when I, when I read about someone like Father Greg Boyle, um, and there's people I've known who have had that sort of that level of commitment and what they're really doing every day is taking a risk, right? He's surrounding himself with people that are coded in our society as dangerous. And he mm. is, I'm, I'm guessing he doesn't carry weaponry. He's not wearing a bulletproof vest. He is, you know, vulnerable and open in a way that is more disarming than, you know, uh, martial art. And it's because he has a certain underlying belief in how the world works that is so powerful that other people that it's a it's a sales job he's basically selling other people on his version of reality yes. and when we start to change we don't have that right so you're going to coach me to be less reactive to tell people to shut up less there's a reason that i'm telling people to shut up right there's some coherent understanding that i have of the world and so there's there's going to be a gap there where i am letting go of what I know is going to protect me. And I have to be somehow open to seeing a new reality, to trying something and seeing that it's going to be okay. How, how, how do we, how can people help themselves in that gap? Um, that's a great question. And um, I think it comes back to something that Marshall has told us many, many times, rather than adopting something new, how about stopping something old or which is, you know, harming you. So, for example, I, an example would be communication or whatever. Um, not be if you're the senior leader, don't be the first one to speak. So basically shut up. And I have done this. Um, I have created flashcards for leaders in that kind of situation. And, you know, the world, it, the word says pause <laughs> and so or stop. Mm. And it's a reminder. And so they'll say, OK, you know, John, I tried. I did. I wasn't the first one to speak in the meeting. And I'll say, how'd that go? You know, it went pretty well. We got some great ideas. OK, what's the next step? You know, um, I'm going to be more attentive to listen. So because so when Howie raises his hand, I know exactly what Howie's going to say. And I'm going to cut him off. And I say, how about not cutting Howie off? How about listening to Howie? OK, I will listen <laughs> and I'll let him explain and I'll say, thank you for sharing that. Does anyone else have any comment on what Howie said or that? Time? So how does that go? Small incremental steps. My, my coaching model is um, all of us, I think many in coaching use it is what's your coaching goal and what are your tactics? And the tactics will change, you know, the little habits you uh, try, the experiments you try. Um, like, for example, with patients, I heard once, uh, it's a great example of, um, uh, there's a gentleman, I think it was Alan Sokol was on interview. He wrote a book called Patience and, you know, how to exert it. And it was like somebody called in and I said, you know what I do? I go in a supermarket and I stand in the longest line, you know, and yeah. I just stand, you know, simple stuff like that. So, you know, so I think I think how it's a matter of simple steps and stuff in many situations. Sometimes you have to do something radical, and that's you know uh, uh, maybe uh, over my head, coaching wise. So. Gotcha. Well, so how can people find your writing and, you know, your, what's your online presence? Where can people follow you and get more? Well, a, a Google search will get you to me, but it's my best, easiest way is uh, johnbaldoni.com. That's my website. I also have a blog okay. site, johnbaldoni.com. And um, so I'm there and all of my books are on uh, the retail place to the world, Amazon. And so they're all welcome. And if you want to drop me an email, it's john at johnbaldoni.com. 
Okay. Can you will you spell John Baldoni for the people who are just listening? B A L D O N I. So Baldoni. Right. And it's John right. with it, and it's John with an H. John with an H. Thank you. Very good. Okay, I'll put it in the show notes, but not everybody reads those. So the the book is Grace Under Pressure, available wherever books are sold. And johnbaldoni.com is where people can find out more. Howie, it's been a pleasure. Thank you for this opportunity. We had a, you ask great questions and um, my privilege to be with you. Well, thanks for sharing this. It's just, you know, it, it, it feels like there's a, there's a, a drought of positivity and compassion and grace. And so, you know, re reading your book is a little bit, you know, like a summer shower on a parched field. So it's a, uh, it's a beautiful, you know, it's a beautiful and necessary thing. And um, I hope it goes out into the world and, and makes a, makes a huge impact. Thank you. I love that a summer shower on a, 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 a parched field. I like that. Thank you. So, oh. All right. Well, be well. Thanks again. Uh, I hope to talk to you again soon.